Policy Research Institute. We're a nonpartisan think tank and a registered 501c3, and we're based in Philadelphia. Um, we have a very interesting program this morning on political warfare at China's periphery, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, I don't know how we could come up with a more timely topic given what's going on, uh, but we, we did. Um, we'd also uh, like to thank our members and partners for the generous support. Uh, without that, we couldn't bring these kind of programs to you. So those of you who aren't members, I encourage you to give us a look and consider joining. Um, this event is part of a series we're having all week based on the articles that were in our spring edition of Orbis, uh, FPRI's uh, quarterly journal. And uh, another pitch for membership, under certain categories of membership, you get a free subscription to Orbis. So do consider doing that. Um, a few housekeeping uh, uh, issues. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen and see the chat function, please use that. Click on that if you want to ask a question because we will have a question and answer um, uh, question and answer period. Um, this morning, um, our uh, moderator is Jacques Delisle, who is the director of FPRI's Asia program. He's also the Stephen A. Cousin Professor of Law, Professor of Political Science, and director for the Center of the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. He specializes in Chinese politics and legal reform, U.S.-China relations, cross-strait relations, and China's engagement with international legal order. And if you peruse our website and um, search on his name, you will find articles on all these topics. He's also the author of To Get Rich is Glorious, a challenge challenges facing China's economic reform and opening at 40. Um, and he co-edited with Avery Goldstein, which he co-edited with Avery Goldstein. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jacques, who will be uh, our moderator this morning. Uh, thank you, Raleigh, and thank you everyone for joining us. And welcome to the first in our series of four sessions we'll be doing at this hour through the end of the week on the question of political warfare, and sharp power in and from East Asia. Today uh, and for the, for the next few sessions, we'll be looking at different aspects of this phenomenon. Uh, we'll be talking to authors of several of the articles in the special issue of Orbis from spring of 2020 uh, that Raleigh just mentioned. Um, and today we're gonna start out with our first installment, which will focus on political warfare at China's periphery, basically political warfare targeting Taiwan and Hong Kong. And this session, plus our remaining three sessions, will all be recorded and posted uh, with links from FPRI's website. So joining me today for this discussion are uh, two guests, uh, two authors from our special issue. One is Victoria Tinborhue. Uh, she is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. Notre Dame, sorry, my French is kicking in there. University of Notre Dame in Indiana. Long day already, Victoria. Um, and her writings, uh, for anyone who follows Hong Kong related issues or many issues related to Chinese politics, you've probably seen her work. It's been in Foreign Affairs, the Journal of Democracy. Uh, she's been writing a lot in the Washington Post lately about some of the developments uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, and again, appears in many, many major fora. Uh, she's the author of a really quite interesting book, which I recommend to anyone, uh, State Formation in Ancient China and Early Modern Europe. She's also written extensively on movements before the one we'll be talking about today, uh, the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong, uh, the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan, and other such issues. Uh, she has written and commented extensively on the 2019 protests in Hong Kong, which I guess now become the 2020 protests in Hong Kong, as the year has, uh, has kicked over. Uh, and she's really one of these uh, terrific people who's both a scholar and uh, a public intellectual and something of an activist uh, in her native Hong Kong on these issues. Our other guest today is uh, Tom Shattuck, who I guess isn't really a guest, but is kind of a co-host. Uh, Tom is a colleague at FPRI. He's a research associate in our Asia program and managing editor uh, at the Institute. Uh, he writes a lot on Taiwan issues uh, for FPRI and in other fora and has a monograph on transitional justice uh, in Taiwan. So uh, just to frame this a little bit, um, George Kennan classically defined political warfare as the logical applica application of Clausewitz's doctrine, that is the continuation of politics through other means, in times of peace. And uh, on Kennan's definition, it includes using all means short of war to achieve national objectives. 
In its modern form, it's overt and covert uses of a range of measures, diplomatic, political, economic, and information, uh, to affect policy decisions being taken in other states or polities, uh, and sometimes to change the political context uh, in which those decisions are made through means that are neither violent, hard power, uh, nor limited to persuasion or voluntary transactions, soft power or economic inducement. Sharp power itself is distinguished from coercive hard power and persuasive soft power uh, and is in uh, Christopher Walker's definition, something that seeks to pierce, penetrate, or perforate uh, the political media, social aspects, and, and uh, other issues in targeted states to manipulate their politics and at times to undermine their political institutions. Well, that's a little policy wonky and a little political science-y perhaps, but I think it's a pretty good framing uh, for the issues that we're gonna be talking about today in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. We're gonna turn first to Hong Kong and then Taiwan and we'll loop back and forth some. Uh, but as, as our, uh, as our uh, uh, audience here I'm, sh I'm sure knows, it's been an extremely uh, active time in Hong Kong uh, in terms of the issues that we're, we're talking about here. Uh, I think everyone's been familiar with the protests that broke out in 2019 in opposition to the extradition bill, as it was called, introduced by the Hong Kong government, ostensibly to deal with a rather lurid murder case of a young couple uh, that went uh, from Hong Kong to Taiwan and the question of getting the, the murderer, the, the, the male couple back to Taiwan for, or back to Hong Kong for prosecution. But really it was about the mainland and about the possibility that this law would allow Hong Kong residents, Hong Kong citizens to be extradited to China, possibly for prosecution in politically charged uh, or politically tainted offenses. And it, as Victoria, I'm sure will go into it, it created quite a stir, um, questions of whether this would undermine Hong Kong's promised legal autonomy under the one country, two systems model that was put in place for 97 and was supposed to, in 97, was supposed to last for 50 years. It drew on the background of the umbrella movement, which was a pro-democratization drive several years earlier. Uh, and uh, the 2019 protests over the extradition law clearly, quickly evolved into a mass popular movement. Uh, we've all seen the violent scenes of police attacks on protesters, protesters uh, sometimes engaging in violent tactics themselves, uh, and the, the roundup of, of um, participants in the movement for possible prosecution and certainly detention. It evolved into a set of demands, including that the chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, step down that the police be investigated for their violent behavior toward the protesters, that the protesters not be prosecuted for rioting and other quite expansively defined offenses, uh, and movement toward democracy, the thing that had been the goal uh, of the reforms that were rejected and that led to the umbrella movement five years earlier. All of that came to something of a halt uh, in the last several months. Uh, everything is affected by COVID-19, and of course protests uh, were were, were stopped uh, ostensibly because of the public health issues related to COVID-19, and yet they have erupted again uh, in the wake of something that just came out this week at the so-called two meetings, the National People's Congress and Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference in Beijing, uh, where suddenly we got news that there was, there was going to be a national law that is adopted by the NPC, not by the local legislature in Hong Kong, to deal with the central people's governments, the Chinese government's long-running concerns about uh, sedition, secession, security, uh, in Hong Kong in a way that would further override um, uh, the kinds of autonomy that we've been talking about here. So that's a, a long wind up here. So let me turn to Victoria um, about the, the questions of how political warfare or, or sharp power in effect uh, turns into this. So could you take us back uh, to the origins and the evolution of the 2019 protest movement uh, and tell us what Beijing did that you had put in this category of political warfare or, or something like it uh, to, to try to deal with what it at least claimed was an existential threat uh, to its sovereignty and rule over Hong Kong. Um, you know, again, we had talk perhaps the People's Armed Police or even the People's Liberation Army might move in and there were certainly attempts to uh, persuade, but there's a lot that fell in that gray area in between. So can you take us through how you see those issues having evolved in the context of the 2019 protests? Well, great, thank you so much for having me. Essentially, I would argue, I think that it, the way that you frame political warfare is pretty correct. At the same time, many people have also been arguing that Beijing doesn't really understand soft power. And I think that they, not that they don't understand soft power, but they have a very different understanding of soft power, referring to anything that is not military. And so what happens with Hong Kong is that they, Beijing always, basically from day one, had a very different understanding of one country, two systems. 
So for Hong Kong people, this is about one country, how, to, how Hong Kong people can preserve their freedoms and autonomy against uh, China's one-party dictatorship. Whereas Beijing's understanding of one country's two systems was just that, well, it's not about freedoms, it's about capitalism. It's about capitalism versus socialism. And so basically from day one, uh, they already inserted Article 23, essentially telling Hong Kong that you guys have to uh, enact national security law, but quote unquote, on your own. And then at the same time, the basic law also, also prohibits um, interference of Beijing's security forces in Hong Kong. And that means that if Beijing were to abide by some of the letters and spirits of the basic law and the one country to systems framework, there are many things that they cannot do. So it's essentially these are the, the kind of the limits that I highlight in the article, hard and soft uh, repression. Because one, they're not supposed to send out, go out military tanks, but even though the PRA, the People's Liberation Army, has garrisoned in Hong Kong. They're not supposed to do that. And two, also, Beijing security officers are not supposed to, um, to enforce the law, whatever you know, Beijing's law in Hong Kong. So, a couple of times that they actually kidnapped, for example, a bookseller from Hong Kong and, and took him across the border. Another case, a, a millionaire with a lot of connections to top leaders was also kidnapped from the Four Seasons Hotel and taken across the border. Beijing didn't like that, that they were essentially openly violating the, base, the basic law and one country to systems and all of those um, limits. And so the whole idea of the, entire, the, the extradition bill was to make all of those kidnappings legal. And, and then another thing that, another limit is that there, Beijing also, until recently, cannot really infiltrate or completely subvert the local courts. Local courts, if you take people to court, you charge them, there's a very good chance that a lot of these people will just be dismissed or, or the charges will be dismissed or they will be sentenced to, you know, um, the leaders of the umbrella movement were convicted and sentenced to up to 16 months in jail. And Beijing was worried that even if after these people are released, they may come out and launch a new protest. And so the answer to that is, uh, is to use repression to make sure, to, one form is hard repression. So the police have been subverted. So if, they, if Beijing cannot send out uh, public security officers to, to patrol the street of Hong Kong, they have subverted Hong Kong police forces to do that job and break people's bones, torture people in the detention center. Another way is that knowing that you know these guys will be released, and so then people, a lot of people, including you know Hong Kong people or observers, were really stunned by how brutal the police could be. But essentially, this is a decapacitation campaign to break the bones of a lot of these people, protesters and the supporters, so that they will not even be able to come out um, to protest against when they are disabled. And then another form that I would also call kind of really soft a repression is not exactly soft impression, it's not very soft. But then another limit is that Hong Kong still continue to enjoy certain freedoms. People are still supposed to be able to go protest. They are still supposed to be able to organize strikes and, and form labor unions. Except then now um, people also get, get dismissed from the jobs if they are caught to have, you know, put, put on social media. Go Hong Kong, for example, they get dismissed. They don't get, uh, they don't, they are not sentenced to 16 years in jail, but then they are dismissed. So this is a form of repression. What has transpired in the, in, since last Friday is that Beijing apparently took up the facade that they don't feel that they, they can be, they should be constrained by the basic law anymore. Now that Beijing decided that they're just going to impose national security law enacted by the National People's Congress and the Committee, and then immediately afterwards, the Hong Kong chief executive should just promulgate it. That's completely just ignores all of those limits that the article talks about. Another thing just coming from um, today is even more worrisome is that the, the PLA garrison commander in chief in Hong Kong said that he is going to follow whatever law that will be help that will help Beijing enforce the national security law. So it seems that all gloves are off at this point. Jacques, you're muted. Um, just one terrific overview, um, a, a lot to chew on there. I just want to follow up on a couple of, of uh, points here. Uh, one is that, that as your description, I think, nicely captures, there has been a, an attempt to stop short of what seems like 
might makes right brute force here in, in a few ways, and it's kind of been unraveling. So if we go back through the, the history that you pointed to, one of the things that, that Beijing and the local government in Hong Kong, which, are, you know, which obviously uh, very much is on Beijing's page for most things, um, has done is to, to say, look, this is all being done in a proper way. It's not brute force, right? So when we look at the extradition law, uh, extradition bill, the claim was this is perfectly permissible. It's being put through LegCo, the Legislative Council, the local legislature, rather. And, and the claim was, you know, it's just it's going to it's going to be just another Hong Kong ordinance, one that Beijing perhaps rather likes. Although there are some signs that Carrie Lam may have been more enthusiastic, uh, even than, than, than Beijing in taking the step. But it's being done through proper process. Um, you saw the same sort of thing with respect to the umbrella movement. The claim that people were being rounded up and prosecuted for violating public order, destroying public property, uh, these kinds of things, and uh, for protests that were against a decision that Beijing claimed was its right as the interpreter of the basic law through the National People's Congress Standing Committee, the saying we don't need to go and, and move more quickly down the democratic path that the protesters wanted. And in 2019, the claim is people are being arrested for rioting and attacks on public property, attacks on police, and so on. Um, so there's always this attempt to say, we're just doing what the law allows. And now, even with the national security law, it's kind of interesting because in a way, it harkens back all the way to 2003 when the then chief executive of Hong Kong, Dong Jianhua, tried to push through uh, something that is implementing these basic law provisions about stopping sedition and secession and that sort of thing. But now it's not being left to the locals, it's being taken in-house in Beijing. So you see this kind of fraying of, of the, the, the claims of procedural propriety. And even the possible use of force with the PLA or the, gar the PLA garrison in Hong Kong, people will point on the Chinese side and in the Hong Kong government side to the garrison law or to the basic law itself, which say under certain circumstances of loss of control and disorder, they can be invited in. So there's always an attempt to say this is not brute force, it's legally proper. Now for you and other people who are on the pro-democracy side in Hong Kong, the answer has always been, yeah, maybe but you're, you're really testing the limits here, you're cutting corners procedurally, you're taking more power into the center, and further, this is just not the way Hong Kong is supposed to be. This is not democratic principles, this is not what people in Hong Kong work. So that seems to be the lines that have been drawn in the umbrella movement in the 2003 protests and in the current protests. Where do you see that, those battle lines hardening, uh, and, and, and what is the government, either in Hong Kong or Beijing, trying to do about the opposition it's encountering from students, from the legal profession, uh, from some people in the civil service who actually strikingly joined the protests in 2019. How do you see those battle lines drawn out, being drawn, and how do you see them playing out? This is great. Um, essentially, I, I think you're quite right. One aspect that Beijing has learned from Zhou Nai's soft power is that you have to tell the story right. You have to tell China's story right. So I, I would say that a big issue about China's soft power soft meaning actually sharp power and then soft repression is to tell the Beijing side of the narrative and they've always been pointing to you know we have to do this or um, when it, when explaining why Beijing is imposing this national security law on Hong Kong they say that well Hong Kong mm -hmm. has been left in this be quote and unquote defenseless situation because um, article 23 has never been enacted now the argument is that because in, in 2003 article 23 was um shelled because half a million people poured into the street and and then why the bill was shelled the the situation 2003 is very different from the situation today in 2003 the liberal party of hong kong a pro-business party they had a few votes they actually could, sh could completely sway whether the bill would get passed or not Several of them, because they still had to confront direct elections in future uh, subsequent elections, they decided that, sorry, we cannot support the bill. And because the government did not have enough votes, and so they shelved it. And over the years, repeatedly, it's because the bill also, it will be very hard to satisfy Beijing while also conforming to the international covenants on civil and political rights. And so it's always been shelved. But then today's legislative council is a very different animal altogether. So again, just last week, because um, the pro-democracy legislators were trying to block the national anthem bill from getting from um, being deliberated at the council meeting, and they decided that while well, we're just going to violate even the rules and procedures of the legislative council and kick Dennis Kwok out and uh, and quote unquote voted a a pro-establishment um, uh, legislator to chair the committee, 
So now the national anthem law is going to, to be passed. Given this is given that the governments or Beijing's the Beijing side, the provision side has enough votes to push through any bills, in a way that it's actually surprising to a lot of people why they would even go through this essentially nuclear option to impose the national security law from Beijing. They could have just shuffled down their, their preferred Article 23 uh, through the Legislative Council. And it, they would face basically maybe some uh, fist fighting in let's say, Legislative Council building, but they wouldn't be able to do, do much. But maybe um, people are suspecting it's possible that if, if Beijing had taken that route, it would still be difficult to um, allow Beijing to stand into openly and formally sending security agents to operate in Hong Kong. So that may be one reason, but this is all guesses. Of course, we don't really know what uh, Xi Jinping has in mind. Terrific. So one of the things that comes through in your article, I think, is, is less uh, well understood or less talked about in much of the discourse on what's going on in Hong Kong, uh, is how different segments of Hong Kong society that are pretty close to state activity uh, behave. And, and here I've, I've got really uh, two that, that are, well, two, two, and two are the one that aren't, I think I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on. Uh, one is um, the police. And the police in Hong Kong have an interesting history, right? They started out as being kind of corrupt and disliked, and then there was this huge reform in the 1970s, and it really came out by the 1990s being referred to as Asia's finest police force. And now they've been front and center in using tear gas and in, in a lot of violent activities. There are obviously some of the most ardent demands from the protesters this last time out are for accountability of the police, an independent inquiry, uh, and, and hold him accountable uh, for behavior that I think people would not have predicted from the Hong Kong police not that long ago. So, so how do we understand this, this change in the role and the public legitimacy of the police? And then the second group I'd like to ask about is lawyers. Uh, Hong Kong's uh, politics, especially on the Democratic side, are overwhelmingly lawyers. Um, uh, you're even married to a lawyer. <laughs> there's, you know, there's, there's a, that, that's been a very big part of it. And, and of course, there's a solicitor barrister distinction, but the barristers in particular have been more and more vocal in pushing back against this sort of thing. So, so how do you understand those phenomena and how does it figure into the way Beijing is trying to deal uh, with the pushback it's getting in Hong Kong? Um, this is a really good and important point as well. I grew up in, um, in the 70s and 80s when the police had been completely cleaned up with the International Commission Against Corruption doing a, a very good job. So the, the police were really impartial and upright. So I always like to tell the story when I was a little girl and my mom would take us out and then she would always tell us that if you ever get lost, go get help from a, a police auntie and uncle. And, and so when the police actually began to be the people in dark corners during the umbrella movement of 2014, and there were several cases when they were caught on film, this, these police officers were subject to um, uh, a prosecution and, and also um, punishment. This time in 2019, these police officers, basically they would do, they would do the beatings and is essentially torture in front, of, in the full view of live streaming media and journalists. Why they would do that, I suspect that they essentially want to provoke uh, response, very aggressive responses. They actually want to see radicalization among the protesters. But how did the police who, that used to be Asia's finest become so easily co corrupted and subverted? I would say that it wasn't easy for most of us to, to really digest that. When um, Hong Kong people and, and, and you know, Hong, Kong, Hong Kongers in the U.S. watch all of this, we kind of didn't even believe that all those acts were done by Hong Kong's own police forces. There was a lot of speculation that they were all done by mainland security officers because they already began to mask their face and mask their ID card. But in hindsight, it is actually not very difficult to understand. If we have also Hong Kong politicians who are, who are pleading to Beijing to impose, essentially Beijing also says that they are doing this because, you know, at the request of Hong Kong delegates to the National People's Congress. And, and then we also have a lot of Hong Kong politicians who are willing to follow the party line and do whatever Beijing's bidding. We can also even just look at Carrie Lam, the chief executive. She climbed up the ladder as a career servant and for a long time, Hong Kong civil servants are also very trusted in, in doing the, in, an impartial job. 
being impartial means that you don't really take care of people, you don't worry about people's political positions, whether they vote for the pro-establishment camp or vote for the pro-democracy camp. You should treat them all equally. But now today, the governments, the police, they treat the opposition and the supporters very differently. And so once you have the appointment system, once these people know that they're beholden not to Hong Kong people, but to Beijing, to the powers that be, and you also shower these police officers with a lot of benefits. They are very fancy um, five-star plus uh, clubhouse facilities. They also have huge social funds and the police officers who, were, who, who fire live shots at people. Well, early on they were reprimanded, but now they're promoted. And so you have all these incentives. It's, then it makes it easy to understand why they can be so easily corrupted. And about the question about lawyers, what is also interesting is that it is true today that you have a civil, par a civil civic party that's composed of basically mostly lawyers. But early on in the early stages with the Hong Kong's, with Hong Kong's Democrat, uh, Democratic Party, a lot of them were actually social workers. Social workers were, and teachers were the forefront of the, social, of the Hong Kong's democracy movements because in the 80s, they had been there just fighting for um, the rights and, 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 um, and basically also the, the place of these um, the marginalized people. And then it was very easy for, for them to turn their attention to politics once um, Hong Kong's future became on the table. But the lawyers are very, very effective because a lot of Hong Kong common people just looked at that oh, they know the law. So when the Hong Kong Bar Association issued a statement, it carries so much more weight than any of the political parties or politicians doing the same thing. Thanks, so that's, that's an excellent uh, segue into a couple of, of questions we got. First, uh, one from our colleague, June Dreyer, another a senior fellow here at, at FPRI, who is who I'm Victoria knows certainly. Um, and, and she poses the following question, I think, I think is a nice follow on to what you just said, which is, is one way to understand what Beijing and the Hong Kong government are up to is essentially choking off all the peaceful and orderly channels, you know, not allowing democratization whereby the Democrats who get 50, 60 percent of the votes still wind up being a minority in the legislature. The chief executive, instead of being directly elected, is run through the selection committee that's reliably pro-Beijing. And there's nominally more than one candidate, but, but there's pre-screening. That was of course, focus the umbrella movement protest. The, the, what these do, and then you add to that the the the, the uh, prohibitions on protests, whether it's COVID related or unlicensed protests. That all these things have essentially choked off the channels that would allow people to express the kind of views you're describing. So they're left with nothing but violent means, uh, ostensibly illegal means, and essentially that then gives Beijing the card to play and the local government the card to play of saying, well, whatever your views, you just can't push them this way. Is this essentially? A, a trap that plays into kind of a, a political warfare or, or sharp power game. You know, uh, we're going to make you, if you want to make your views known, go down this path. And once you do that, we can then claim to prosecute you under laws everybody could agree with, which is you don't blow up uh, the buildings, you don't set fire to a campus or a subway station, that kind of thing. Great. I also actually made exactly this argument uh, in another piece for written for China leadership. Is This is also what I was hinting at. In 2000, 2014, during the Umbrella Movement, a lot of the beatings were done in dark corners, and they were very upset that uh, some of the beatings were actually filmed on camera. And of course, those uh, uh, the TV, TV reporters and cameramen were actually also, um, I, I, I'm not sure if they still held a job. And then, yes, definitely in Hong Kong, how do you exercise right? You know, your freedom of expression. If you want to organize any protest, you have to get a no objection permit from the police. If they do not issue that permit, if you still gather, then it is basically unlawful assembly. And uh, on April 18th, 15 very veteran pro-democracy leaders, they were arrested for unlawful assembly. And, they, and the charges refer to a mass demonstration on August 31st when people were just basically chanting slogans and, and singing hymns, uh, Christ, uh, Christian hymn songs. And if this is, you know, if peaceful protests are, this, uh, are not allowed, then what do you tell people to do? Once I was asked a question, where's the Gandhi in Hong Kong? Well, we actually have a long list of you know, Gandhi-like figures in Hong Kong, Martin Lee, Benny Tai, the, the Occupy Trio, they all urge nonviolence. But also think about the long list of nonviolent and peaceful forms of protest that Hong Kong people have conducted. 
the most famous of all is actually the lemon walk. People just put post-its, sometimes very simple post-it messages, sometimes very elaborate hand paint and paint and paint to the handmade art on these lemon walls. And they spread up to Dao's Hong Kong in every single district in the summer. And then the, the people also form the human chain in late August. Uh, people also hiked to the top of the Lime Rock, um, which is an iconic mountain uh, for Hong Kong, representing the Hong Kong spirit. And, there been, and also there are strikes and boycotts. But the government actually called even the, the strike by medical workers in, um, uh, uh, to, to protest against you know, the government's refusal to, to close the borders uh, when the coronavirus was spreading. The the Beijing called that called the strike a political virus. So when all forms of nonviolence means of, uh, means of protest are blocked off, people are just basically automatically turned to right, radicalized actions. But just speaking on that too, when protesters are confronted with a very high capacity with repressive regime, the turn to violence is almost actually a lot more useless than in other cases. It's just not going to get anywhere. Uh, people uh, learned the lesson, so they began to form stronger labor unions. They also uh, trying to have more strikes and also forming the uh, yellow economic circle, meaning that um, pro-democracy force is just going to these yellow businesses. But again, Beijing is saying that this, this amounts to uh, economic terrorism. So what is left for people? But still, these means can be more sustainable. Great. So I, I think we do need to start moving on to the Taiwan uh, question. We'll loop back. So there are a bunch of questions in the queue here. I, I picked out uh, June's partly because I thought it was on point now. Many of the other questions are forward looking. And after we talk about Taiwan for a while, we're going to look back, loop back to the question of what lies ahead. And I'll be turning back to Victoria for that. And I think some of the questions will, will speak to that. Uh, so as a segue to the Taiwan side of things, uh, Victoria mentioned Benny Tai and Martin Lee. Uh, these, of course, are, are two very prominent uh, pro-democracy uh, senior figures. Uh, Benny Tai, of course, was uh, prosecuted for his role in the run-up to the Occupy Central Umbrella Movement and has faced great professional and personal peril due to that. Uh, Martin Lee was rounded up in this latest batch of roundup of Democrats. Uh, so uh, the methods that Victoria is talking about, even those who are, I think, uh, quite uh, restrained and measured, uh, you know, uh, uh, rhetorically and intellectually forceful, but hardly hardly uh, violent, uh, folks are, are facing that kind of marginalization she's talking about. But the other thing in, in, in Victoria's discussion here is how much in Hong Kong is all about what you can do within Hong Kong. And as we'll talk about some, I think, near the end of our session today, Hong Kong has not been very successful at attracting a lot of international pushback. Yes, there have been statements from the UK, which is the party to the treaty, the joint declaration that promised one country, two systems and autonomy and gradual and orderly progress toward democracy and all that. That China now insists is something of a dead letter because this is an internal Chinese affair. Uh, and the US has made noises and we may see some legislation. There is the US Hong Kong Policy Act, there's the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which threatens some kind of external pressure. But I think Victoria would agree it's not been terribly uh, robust or effective, at least as yet. In Taiwan, um, China takes a similar view. This is an internal Chinese affair in which the outsiders should not mention, but Taiwan's government has been in a stronger position uh, to try to protect itself from the kinds of pressures that, that Beijing might exert, um, including those we'd associate with political warfare. Uh, but there's an international dimension to this game that's been a little more heavily played. So I want to turn to, to uh, Tom Shattuck about this. His piece in the uh, Orbis uh, issue is, is about the slice, the sort of international slice, as it were, of what Beijing is up to on the Taiwan front. And, and here, primarily, uh, Beijing's uh, essentially cancellation of the tacit diplomatic truce of the Maingzhou era when uh, Beijing did not seek to have other states or welcome other states switching their diplomatic alliance for uh, diplomatic relations from Taipei uh, to Beijing. That's been uh, torn up as has the tolerance Beijing was showing for Taiwan's greater access to international organizations. The most obvious example, of course, being the WHA, the World Health Assembly, the annual meeting of members of the World Health Organization, which uh, Taiwan was allowed to attend as, a, as an observer for uh, eight years under the previous president, Ma Ying-jeou, under Tsai Ing-wen, not so much. Uh, and despite COVID and, and the issues of China's role there, uh, the bid to get Taiwan back in this year has not happened. But Tom's focusing mostly on the diplomatic uh, issue. And here, with the truce being torn up, We've seen uh, Taiwan lose roughly one third uh, of its uh, previous relatively small number of uh, diplomatic allies uh, since Tsai came to power. And now that she's just begun her second term, we're watching what happens 
uh, beyond that. Uh, so, so Tom, in your piece, you go into this. I want to ask you um, the sort of devil's advocate question here, which is, you know, Taiwan's got started out with a couple of dozen uh, a few years ago. Now it's down to 15. Uh, does it matter? Uh, what's at stake in terms of Taiwan losing diplomatic ties with what are a small number of relatively small, not terribly powerful uh, countries? Why is this an important and effective we could call it political warfare tactic uh, by Beijing. As the the uh, most important question is, do these, does Taiwan's official diplomatic relations actually matter? Because China has about or 180 countries with official ties, whereas Taiwan, as you said, only has 15. And they're all very, very small countries. Um, since uh, 2016 have switched, plus the Gambia was finally allowed to recognize China after being frozen out by the PRC. Um, whereas Taiwan has informal relations with at least 57 nations. So economically, 15 countries, I don't want to say they don't matter, but they're very, very small. So these allies for Taiwan they're not going to benefit per se because when you switch from Taiwan to the PRC, that is just a diplomatic cut. It doesn't mean that economics, the economic relation is completely severed as well. Um, so in terms of economics, there's really little benefit to having these 15 countries. They're all in the Pacific or in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the other two, one is in Africa and the other is the Vatican. So these countries aren't economic powerhouses. The other aspect is, which has come up last week, uh, was with international organizations where 50 countries are present in the United Nations and they're able to speak out in favor of Taiwan. They can stand up at the podium and add for one's inclusion. They write letters and it forms a nice base where Taiwan is still in the conversation. Um, but once again, there's, these countries are very small. They don't have as much clout as the United States or Canada or obviously China with how things are going. So once again, allies don't play a very large role in getting Taiwan to the table. And then the third aspect that may or may not matter is its legitimacy. Part of the country is a form of the question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one was around, did it actually happen? If you're a country and no one is your country, are actually a country. So right now there are 15 countries that say that Taiwan, the Republic of China, is actually a country. So it provides sort of legitimacy on that front. However, the issue once again of these small not very militarily power recognizing you doesn't provide that much legitimacy. So the flip side of that is while these 15 countries having formal relations with Taiwan isn't really that huge of a deal, Taiwan has very strong informal relations. And that's really what matters for Taiwan at this point, where the United States have a very strong backing for Taiwan. We've seen Australia, Japan, Korea, all of the EU uh, for the WHA last week, uh, they're all speaking out for Taiwan. They all have the main economic relationships. And uh, interestingly enough, China and Hong Kong have one of the largest economic relationships with Taiwan as well. So these informal relations play a much more important role in getting Taiwan um, to the table if it's even possible. Yeah, and then we've seen um, the U.S. as the you know, indispensable, informal uh, backer of, of Taiwan, uh, take the role you're talking about pushing much more strongly in recent years. We've seen in the Trump administration era, uh, Congress getting a lot more active. So things like the Taiwan Travel Act, uh, various National Defense Authorizations Acts, uh, the Asian Reassurance Initiative Act, and the incredibly messy acronym Taipei Act. It's <laughs> Taiwan allies, forgetting about that stands for, but basically we, we, we see these, these stronger expressions of support for Taiwan. Uh, and a piece of it has actually been, especially in the Taipei Act, has been to have the U.S. commit itself to more robust international uh, participation for Taiwan. So uh, calling for um, uh, possible sanctions against uh, states that, uh, in effect, sever diplomatic relations with Taiwan. It's not quite in those language, that language, but that's really what it means. And calling for U.S. support for Taiwan's participation in international organizations. So in a way, this is a U.S. pushback, the kind of thing that has been very weak in Hong Kong, maybe not terribly robust with Taiwan, 
but do you see that as, as, as helping or helpful? Yes, absolutely, informal support, uh, but where we're talking about trying to push back against China's agenda to squeeze Taiwan's diplomatic partners, to reduce their number, and to squeeze Taiwan's international space and organizations, is this an effective uh, response from the United States and other like-minded countries? Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. These, the laws that the U.S. passed are obviously very good to show that the U.S. backs Taiwan and supports Taiwan, but there hasn't been much success. Um, last week, they had the WHA meeting. Taiwan was on the agenda. It was supposed to be, there was supposed to be a vote for Taiwan inclusion because it's been uh, not a, an observer of the WHA for some time since President Tsai took office. And as John said, part of these laws to push for Taiwan's greater inclusion in these groups. But shockingly, Monday morning, I woke up to find out that the foreign minister of Taiwan decided to take Taiwan, the Taiwan item off of the agenda because they learned that while the United States, entirety of the European Union, and essentially every major democracy in the world supported Taiwan, the United States was still not able to muster enough votes to get uh, a majority for Taiwan to be included. So while we have these laws, the implementation, at least as of now, hasn't been that successful with the WHA. And the flip side, with the sanctions possibility against countries that downgrade relations with Taiwan, I think that's dangerous because if you're threatening a country with a downgrading in relations or cutting off relations or whatever the Trump administration decides, in the event that one of these 15 countries makes that decision to switch from Taiwan to China, that'll further push that country into China's orbit. So while it is well-meaning to threaten punishment for this downgrade in relations, you could undermine the interest by pushing them further, either economically or politically, into the Belt and Road or just into China's orbit. And especially Latin American countries, we have a strong history in the United States that dates back to the Monroe Doctrine of the United States has superiority in the Western Hemisphere. So by enacting this law to the letter, you may be undermining the U.S. security by having actually parts uh, fall into Chinese hands in Latin America or these countries just deciding that China can offer more than the United States can, at least for the Trump administration. Okay, so that, that's, you know, I think, a, a nice uh, walk through the international uh, dimension of this. Uh, there is, of course, um, a piece of the Taiwan story that, uh, that is a bit more analogous to what Victoria was talking about in Hong Kong. And this is something that the article by uh, uh, Jia Qian Zhang and Alan Yang in Orbis uh, gets into, uh, which are, are, are uh, more conventional domestic targeting political warfare. And uh, as they put it, uh, Beijing weaponized uh, economic and social interdependence in an attempt to affect uh, politics uh, in Taiwan. I know Victoria has views that this has gone on in Hong Kong as well. Uh, and just uh, uh, Zhang and Yang go through the obvious um, uh, metrics and the obvious methods here, which include uh, using economic leverage, both carrots and sticks, granting preferential access to certain companies uh, for opportunities on the mainland uh, and for individuals. And this is the, the, uh, the uh, 31 measures, 26 measures, those kinds of, uh, of, of arrangements. Um, and uh, using social ties, so cultivating uh, essentially what in the old days would be called fifth columnists, uh, religious groups, social groups, educational groups, youth groups, uh, tour groups, uh, to, um, to uh, bring them more on board with the mainland, to become uh, groups within the targeted entity, be it Hong Kong or Taiwan, that are in a sense pro-Beijing. Uh, uh, some of it is overt, but a lot of it is covert, a lot of it is hard to trace. And then there's the phenomenon that we in America became all too familiar with uh, one election ago, which is disinformation. Uh, and again, some of it is is flat out, uh, you know, advocacy from traceable websites, sites if Xinhua puts something up, or if uh, the uh, liaison office in Hong Kong for the central government puts something up, uh, or the Taiwan Affairs Office uh, puts something up, then that's fine. That's part of the debate in a democratic uh, a place like Taiwan or a free speech, uh, liberal rights environment like Taiwan or Hong Kong. Uh, but then there are the things where it's a little more surreptitious. Uh, the, the famous Wumadan, the 50 cent army, uh, which will put out its, its views, uh, those who will masquerade as being within either the Taiwanese or Hong Kong uh, systems, uh, putting out uh, views. Um, and, uh, and sometimes going all the way to hacking, uh, getting into websites you know, and, and uh, putting up 
uh, uh, false information or denial of service, spreading rumors. So, you know, we've heard rumors about uh, the, uh, the view that, that uh, uh, the pro-democracy and pro-autonomy protesters in Hong Kong are really being manipulated by the U.S. State Department and the CIA and so on, or that Tsai Ing-wen faked her doctoral degree from the London School of Economics, or even one that I know Tom and I ran across when we were in Taiwan for the elections, where the, uh, the story uh, came out that, 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 that a, a disease was breaking out. This is pre-COVID uh, being, uh, you know, getting much notice. Other uh, that meant they were gonna shut down the polls. So there was no point in going and voting. Uh, so all these kinds of things that are, are essentially classic political warfare tactics, sometimes hard to uh, trace all the way um, uh, back to Beijing, but certainly uh, sometimes, um, sometimes so. So um, just to pick up on a thread, Tom, from when we were there, and then I want to turn to, to one final question and then get to some of the, the questions in the queue, which is, um, you know, during, the, the, during the, the 2020 elections, we saw a lot of efforts in Taiwan to combat disinformation, uh, to sort of expose the bots and the, uh, the planters of false um, um, information and disinformation trying to sow division. Well, what was your sense of, of, of the agenda there? Is Taiwan getting that right? Sort of working with Facebook, Taiwan Fact Check Centers, things like that. I mean, I think working with Facebook when we, when we in that meeting, um, I was a little surprised since Facebook in the United States is very reluctant to get involved in those political arguments, uh, especially around election time. So I thought that was a good, uh, good story to learn that Facebook had partnered with a fact-checking organization in Taiwan where they were actually uh, censoring images and click making like it shaded over if there was some sort of fake news being distributed and it would pop saying this is being flagged it's fake news uh, click here to learn more about why that is another thing that Facebook was doing in Taiwan was limit the I call it the algorithmic reach of certain pages where pages with tens of thousands of followers if it was found out that they were spreading fake news all of a sudden their engagements would significantly decrease as a way to encourage these groups uh, to actually spread real news. So I think Taiwan is getting it right coming from the United States where it appears little is being done in this front with the like with Twitter like we're having it's a big issue right now with things about a cold case that the president's tweeting about where Twitter is refusing to take down some conspiracy theories. Um, in time, they're laying the foundation for that to uh, not be as big of an issue. And obviously with China, um, there's always going to be fake news being distributed. Uh, recently with the World Health Organization, uh, there were the Director General of World Health Organization accused Taiwan of Taiwanese people of making racist remarks against him uh, with the COVID response. And while some of them did come from Taiwan, I believe it was found out that some of them were from that 50 cent army where uh, while they were, it was people masking themselves as Taiwanese, but they were really on the mainland attacking the World Health Organization to further undermine Taiwan's position. Right, and in the Orbis issue, uh, we have some suggestions in the Zhang and Yang piece about what Taiwan can do to counter uh, Chinese political warfare, particularly these kind of disinformation that the covert uh, sorts. Um, and as someone has uh, put in on the, the chat function, or one of the other things that's come out in, in Taiwan's trying to put pushback is sometimes you can detect the mainlanders, right? Sometimes they're foolish enough to use simplified characters, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a tip off. But also uh, what, what a lot of the people who monitor this in Taiwan are particularly good at is picking up terms of phrase and idioms that just sound mainlandy and not Taiwan. Uh, and you know, in a way, uh, Taiwan is sort of the canary in the coal mine for this whole phenomenon because it is so culturally proximate to the mainland, there's been so much a target as of as Hong Kong of these kind of information warfare uh, tactics or the disinformation uh, in social media tactics that, that uh, the concern that it is that these places are highly targeted, easily targetable and highly vulnerable has in a sense made them at the front line of trying to find uh, ways of dealing with this, which I think is a nice uh, way of moving on to the, the last question I want to pose to you. And here I'll be incorporating uh, some of the um, questions that have come into the, the chat function, which is looking ahead, what to do. As I mentioned, you know, uh, Zhang and Yang suggest um, vigilance against what China's up to, the kinds of things the fact checkers do, uh, and just educating the public about 
uh, ways in which uh, disinformation is, is spread and what to look out for, uh, and also partnerships with democracies facing similar challenges. So Taiwan is the canary in the coal mine. The canary has something uh, to teach whatever animal you want to use for us uh, that, that is, is potentially encountering this uh, from various sources, including uh, Russia and China. Now, these are controversial measures. So in Taiwan, there has been this anti-infiltration law, which has been under discussion as a way of dealing with, with, uh, with Chinese uh, and other outsider, primarily Chinese mainline tactics, but it's raised civil liberties concerns. And these are always tough questions. So I want to turn back to Victoria here and then, then back to Tom as well, but first to Victoria on sort of what do we think is going on uh, going forward here? And there are connections between these two cases, of course, because Tsai Ing-wen got reelected in part by saying, you don't want to see going on in Taiwan what's been going on in Hong Kong. If you don't uh, double down in support for Taiwan's democracies and civil liberties, then uh, China's gonna have more of an opening to push the one country, two systems model, which Xi Jinping insists applies to Taiwan as well as to Hong Kong. You don't want that. And that got her a pretty good turnout at the toll polls. Um, so I wanna get Victoria's sense and, and some of our questioners have asked this about what happens going forward. And here there are a few strands of the issue and from our questioners. So let me just put them to you. One is, what should we look for uh, in Hong Kong's June 4th and July 1st? June 4th, of course, the anniversary of the Tiananmen crackdown in Beijing in 1989, which is always the subject of a major gathering uh, protest in, in Hong Kong. July 1st, which of course is the anniversary of Hong Kong's reversion, another focal point uh, where uh, central government Hong Kong uh, relations are always on the table and the legislative council elections coming up legislative elections coming up scheduled for September the expectation was that Democrats would do very well having done so well in the district council elections that you uh, mentioned uh, from last November so what should we expect to see as those go forward and depending on what happens there and what Beijing does with this national security law are we seeing two things the death of one country two systems question mark, and peril to Hong Kong's economic role, its financial uh, system, its financial you know, status the International Financial Center, which has been key to Hong Kong's success and its value uh, for the mainland. You know, is, is Beijing putting that at risk through these methods and through other political warfare methods? So uh, if you could speak to that in a few minutes, we've only got about seven minutes left, so that's a lot of questions. And okay. I do want to flip back okay. to Taiwan. Go ahead, okay, um, so June 4th, it, Hong Kong has held annual June 4th uh, uh, candlelight vigil at Victoria Park every year since 1990. This year, this is not going to happen. The government uses a very convenient excuse uh, by extending the social gathering ban to June 4th. So, so even the, typically, um, the, the police have been just refusing to issue no objection permit. We expect that to happen uh, for July 1st. And so a lot of these, these regular protests are basically going to be stifled. What about electrical, the electrical elections? I myself was planning to go back to vote, but now if the national security law is, is going to get passed and all words are saying that Beijing really wanted to rush it to get passed before the electrical elections, and if that's the case, then I can, no, I can no longer go back to Hong Kong anymore. Why they want to rush? There's a guess that uh, Hong Kong observers believe that Beijing wants to make sure that once the law is there, that they make every single candidate pledge support for the national security law or you get disqualified. So Beijing learned a hard lesson from the district council elections uh, on November 24th last year that, you know, if you don't control something, then these guys are going to, to get all elected. What Beijing has, what the Hong Kong government uh, probably with the Beijing's supporting from behind is to make sure that these democratically elected district councils cannot do anything by like cutting the funding, by basically paralyzing all these meetings and so forth. And then are we talking about the death of one country to systems? Absolutely, because Beijing has come out so blatantly in violating the basic law, uh, not even the, the Senate British Joint Declaration, all those promises made there. Uh, it violates the it, basic law in terms of Article 23 should be enacted in Hong Kong on its own. It also, it also specifies that uh, in Article 18 that only a certain national laws that involves uh, defense and foreign affairs can be attached to NS3. And this is obviously something that Hong Kong, pe Hong Kong people can do on, on their own. And I would say that this is going to be even worse than uh, the end of one country, two system. Many people have been saying that, well, this is going to turn Hong Kong into just another Chinese city, except that Hong Kong is going to fare even worse than Shanghai. In Shanghai, 
there are not too many dissidents. And so it is very easy for the, the security forces just to focus on those few troublemakers and leave everyone alone. In Hong Kong, the sentiments are so strong. They are across the entire spectrum, um, not just young people. So as John mentioned that, you know, of course, young people are the forefront of the kind of what they call, call now today the resistance to Beijing. But every single major protest also has the involvement of uh, all walks of life. We've also seen that professionals, whether the medical workers or social workers or teachers or even accountants and, and um, people working in the financial sector were all coming out to protest the last summer. So be, when you have essentially a large chunk of the population all up in arms, Hong Kong, and my fear is that Hong Kong is going to be treated like Tibet and Xinjiang, way worse than Shanghai. And then it goes back to what a question that uh, Shark uh, threw out earlier, what can the, the world do about it? Basically, we have to talk about the difference between the U.S. Congress and the U.S. administration. Uh, when it comes to Hong Kong as well as Taiwan, the Congress has actually passed a lot of very powerful laws, and the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act essentially provides tools in between, you know, doing nothing and completely taking away Hong Kong's special economic status, its independence custom status. A lot of people are saying that it is really time to impose sanctions on certain individuals, officials, and police officers who are at the forefront of violating Hong Kong's human rights. And another ECE action is to just take away Hong Kong's uh, privilege to import uh, sensitive dual-use technologies. And if Beijing doesn't back down this time, then maybe, you know, if, Hong Kong, if China is going to, Beijing is going to turn Hong Kong into, you know, Shanghai or worse, Tibet and Xinjiang, maybe the Hong Kong special status should be revoked completely. Now, I know that from now on, I can't go back to, to, chat to Hong Kong anymore. Okay, we've got a couple of questions in the chat uh, function here that I want to get out because we're running up against uh, time. Start a couple minutes late, so we're not a couple minutes long. Uh, but but uh, two that, that I'll post to you, these are mostly for Victoria, but Tom should weigh in as well. Um, one is the impact of Hong Kong's handling of COVID-19. Uh, how does that, if, you wrote the article obviously before we knew how that was going to unfold. We now have a story where Hong Kong has handled it successfully. Uh, uh, by international standards, um, uh, but that also has used COVID-19 as an excuse for, for, for stifling the, the public uh, protests and so on. And then there's a, a bigger question which comes from a Voice of America reporter and which uh, I'd hope we would get to in our discussion as well, which is the connection between the Taiwan and the Hong Kong cases. Um, obviously the Hong Kong example was a huge issue in Taiwan's last election. Uh, Hong Kongers look to Taiwan as what can happen in a culturally Chinese place in terms of democracy, but the VOA reporter's specific question is, we're likely to see a lot of people going from Hong Kong to Taiwan. Uh, and, and what's the impact of that? I mean, Taiwan then faces a difficult uh, road to hoe. I mean, how much does it show support for Hong Kong? What's the impact of these people uh, coming um, uh, uh, to, to Taiwan and, and, and how the mainland would target um, uh, that kind of behavior. So somewhat open-ended question. Uh, you got about two minutes to answer it. <laughs> Let me just be very quick before I pass on back to, to Tom is that I'm glad that you, you raised this question because there are already a whole bunch of refugees from Hong Kong going to Taiwan and seeking asylum there. And it looks like a lot more people are going there. But my, I have another kind of really dire scenario that I'm very worried about is if Beijing gets its way, if it can actually completely violate the one country, two systems model and design the British Joint Declaration and International Treaty, and Taiwan and Hong Kong get closer together, and also um, Beijing has also been taking a lot more aggressive measures across all, its, all the borders with India and in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, if Beijing can get its way, I'm worried that Taiwan could be next. Okay, so I'll throw it back to Tom for the last question, the last point, which is young people. Um, and as we've talked about, you're a young person, so you get to answer this question, which is, uh, you know, you spend a lot of time in Hong Kong, uh, sorry, in Taiwan, including among young people. So what one hears in Hong Kong is that the younger generation has been at the forefront of the protest, right? The umbrella movement and the 2019 press, and then Beijing's apparent bet that if you waited out the older generation, young people who only knew Chinese rule and who were worried about their economic futures would be very docile. That has turned out not to be the case. Taiwan's somewhat different situation. We talk about the naturally independent youth, the people who voted heavily uh, for Tsai Ing-wen. Is that, is that kind of a fault line? Um, do you see that as significant in Taiwan politics? Uh, I, I think so. Um, I mean, the, the greater question or issue is in Taiwan, 
um, while the youth is very pro independent, whatever you want to define independence as, there are fewer of this youth generation out there. The ones that are very active are really out there in the forefront, but there aren't as many. And then there's, there is a fear that the KMT has the older generation, uh, not in its pocket, but they support the KMT because they have greater connections to China. So as these young people age, there is this predisposition there they have no con or they have no hold to the mainland so they are very pro we call it pro taiwan pro independence and they're seeing what's happening in hong kong right now with how the youth there the very active youth protesting is being treated so that further uh ends that taiwanese identity where they have less incentive to support the kmt they have less incentive to or want to be unquote reunified with china because they see what what is happening with one country, two systems. They see how one country, two systems. So there's incentive for the youth to ever support greater pro-China, pro-engagement policies with Beijing because seeing what's happening in the streets of Hong Kong right now. And one of the complexities is a stronger Taiwan identity does not necessarily translate into stronger support for independence, but it certainly translates into antipathy toward the one country, two systems model. And again, what Victoria has been writing about in Hong Kong has, has certainly fueled that view in, in both uh, places. Uh, well, we've run a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit over time here, but that's because of the richness of the topic, great questions from our audience, great comments, great input from Tom and Victoria, thank you, Victoria Timberwe, thank you, Tom Shattuck, for providing uh, this rich discussion today. Uh, we will on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday have our next installments of this talk. So those of you who joined us today, I hope you'll join us again for those three sessions. And I will now throw it back to the president of FPRI, Raleigh Flynn, to send us out. Thank you both. Well, thank you, Tom, Victoria, and Jacques. That was incredible. The time flew by. Uh, it, was, it was too brief for such a big topic. Um, we hope you'll come back tomorrow and the rest of the week uh, for more fascinating discussions. Um, for those of you who don't know FPRI, please check out our website, www.fpri.org. If you're not already a member, as I mentioned, consider joining us. And um, there are options of membership where you can get Orbis as well. Orbis has a new editor, uh, Nick Gavostev, who, um, who is uh, going to do a terrific job. And um, he's a professor at the, National War at the Naval War College and a former editor of the National Interest. So check out Orbis as well. We also welcome your feedback. Uh, so please be in touch with us and let us know what you'd like to see more of and uh, give us feedback. Uh, to you and your families, please stay safe. We wish you well, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>